What's up, everybody? Zach Glass here from Our Wicked Lady, welcoming you to another Owl TV live stream Thursday. Tonight, we got a great show for you. Kat Tassini and Jeffrey Kinsey Christopher bring you a tribute to Trish Keenan from the band Broadcast. There's going to be great hosts, great interviews, and of course, great music. Owl TV live stream Thursdays is brought to you by Maker's Mark Bourbon. So if you're at Our Wicked Lady, get yourself a Maker's Drink. And if you're at home, <coughs> cook delivery for a bottle of that sweet Kentucky juice. If you like what you're seeing, be sure to click subscribe so you can keep up to date on everything we're doing here. Now stay tuned for the show. Thank you for joining us. This is Owl TV. For a bottle of that sweet Kentucky juice. If you like what you're seeing, be sure to click subscribe so you can keep up to date on everything we're doing here. everyone and welcome to the broadcast broadcast 2. I'm here with the director Kat Tassini. Hello. And the producer Jeff Kinsey Christopher. Hello. And I'm your host for today Sarai Marino Vega. So what is the broadcast broadcast all about? This is an event we created in tribute to Trish Keenan, the late musician of the band Broadcast which was a British experimental electronic band. And our ultimate goal was to make a feature-length documentary about her and broadcast. So we created these live streams as a way to spread awareness of her story and about our project and share covers and interviews by some really awesome artists that we know. Yes, this is super exciting. I'm super looking forward to all of the artists and the covers. Me too, I'm yeah. so proud oh, of them. Me three. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us more about the documentary so far? Yes, um, we are about to hit the pre-production phase. We've been doing lots of research. Um, we're gearing up to do some test footage to sort of see how we want the feature to look. Creating the sizzle reel. That's what our next goal is, our making sure that everything we have uh, in place for archival research and you know all of our gear is checked and double checked and we also just attained fiscal sponsorship with the international documentary association which is awesome they're a nonprofit, so we'll be under their umbrella um, and they'll be providing us with some great resources and also support. Yes. yes and support and guaranteeing to any donors to our project that the funds will be spent in a smart way. <laughs> oh, that's super exciting. Yes. Okay. So what are, um, so where can we follow this process so far? We have an Instagram account. We have Facebook. We have a YouTube account. We have a Twitch account, even. Follow us on Twitch. An email listing. Email also. sign up sheet yeah. as well. Awesome. And it's called? Echo's answer, right? Yes, that's an important <laughs> detail. Um, there's a broadcast song called Echo's Answer, mm -hmm. which is where I got the idea from. And it's based around this whole concept that although Trish is not on Earth anymore, her influence is still reverberating through so many artists. And we want this film to be the answer to that echo and to bring it to a wider audience. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> Also, it's a great song, so yeah, I think so. <laughs> no, it is. I'm... So in the last broadcast broadcast, I know you guys shared a lot of your thoughts. Jeff, I know you mentioned that broadcast music is really introspective for you. I did. <laughs> is there any song in particular that kind of evokes that in you? And can you share about that? Uh, the song, one of the songs that touched me the most was Black Cat, mm -hmm. actually. It evoked all these emotions and experiences that I've been suppressing, actually and brought them in a way that in both a good and bad sense in terms of uh, makes me relive certain experiences and memories that sometimes I try to avoid <laughs> but it's overall a growing experience I want to say. I actually read that Trish wrote that about her father's psychological hang-ups mm -hmm. and she imagined them as a cat that was always hanging around so it's interesting that it evokes such a rich psychological experience for you too. And it's also our theme song. Um, our friend Emerald Isles covered it. And we have another cover by Emerald Isles coming up to share as well. Exciting. 
So I know in the last broadcast broadcast, Kat, you mentioned that Trish stated that psychedelia has self-help properties. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I think that it's so important in the moment that we're in. Over the past year, there have been all these social movements coming to a head, like Black Lives Matter and police reform. And I think that psychedelia helps us practice stretching our minds and our imagination. And um, that might start with listening to music and it could eventually apply to the real world by helping us imagine new realities that are more progressive and inclusive. And I know, uh, yeah, you had mentioned that last time, but the idea of imagining new realities. And I think that what you just stated is like a very practical manner of seeing that. Last time and now you mentioned how broadcast allows you to imagine new realities. Um, do the sounds themselves bring you to these worlds or do you create the worlds with the sounds that you hear from broadcasts? It's your imagination is like a muscle and listening or watching or just experiencing something new helps you build it up and then on your own you're able to exercise that yourself and create your own um, version of that. Yeah, and they also say like, you know, how human consciousness is kind of all connected to each other. So we're all kind of like building off of our own I different ideas, you know, in a true, way, or, or sharing yeah, them. Definitely. Um, really going past that temporal <laughs> aspect. Yes, sort of like an Inception <laughs> Omniverse type of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly, there you go. Uh, well, I know the documentary is an homage to Trish Keenan's legacy. Is the mission of the documentary also to uh, promote and share more non-traditional folk? Yes. Um, Trish was definitely a non-traditional person as far as being a producer, engineer, and songwriter goes. Um, and our mission with Echo's Answer is not just to create a film, it's also to create a space and a network the community. Yes, to empower female identifying, non-binary, mm -hmm. queer, people of color, just people who aren't usually in the studio. Yeah. We want to have panel discussions, workshops, all yeah. sorts of stuff around all the inclusive. screenings. So can you tell us about the first artist? Yes, so Emerald Isles is a New York City based electronic mm -hmm. synth based producer and musician. He did our opening and intro theme, as I mentioned before, and this is his reimagining of the song Phantom by Broadcast.
So that was great. Uh, thank you so much, Emerald Isles, for that yes. great rendition of that song. Can you tell us about the next artist? Yes. Uh, Grandma, a.k.a. Leslie Hong, is a good friend of mine. Um, also our connection to Our Wicked Lady. She manages and books here. She's a musician. She makes kimchi. <laughs> she does it all. And this is her cover of Corporal.
Um, thank you for participating as grandma, your beep boop project. <laughs> Thanks for um, asking me. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you're a musician in several projects. You also do booking and managing at Our Wicked Lady, where we're filming. Um, how did you get into music originally? Um, well, just like any good Korean kid, uh, I had to take piano lessons from the time I was five. Um, but then, like, I hated piano, transitioned to violin, hated violin, transitioned to viola, hated viola, and then, like, wait a second what is rock and roll? <laughs> so I started playing drums and guitar and um, didn't stop from there. Wow, I actually didn't know that you had studied so many different instruments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I can like read music and stuff, which is definitely been really helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. And then how did you get into like the booking side of things? That was more just like by necessity. Like I think as in a DIY band and booking tours and stuff, you end up like having to do all the work yourself. Um, and then like I was living at a house show or a house show spot, so we would book shows at our house. And then here I don't I like there's like a, a group of people who handle booking, so I'm not like the sole booker, but mm -hmm. I'm just like always looking for to be able to facilitate like an interesting experience. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So are there any challenges that you feel are unique to your experience as a woman in music? Well, I'm non-binary, uh, mm -hmm. but I did identify as a woman for a really long time. And it's definitely one of those things where, first off, you would never ask a man that question. You know, like that's one of those things where it's like, your gender is always on the forefront of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I've been put in a lot of female-fronted shows with just like, very many gentle you know, female singer songwriters clearly you right know, which is actually, like, not your style at all music. Yeah, yeah it's just like oh like that's a woman we'll just throw them on there um i do often feel like tokenized um in a lot of ways um and beyond like the basic stuff of like like men just assuming that i need help doing basic things like actually i can set up my own gear thank you like i had a sound guy once come up on stage and adjust my pedals which is just like i'm like shaking with rage thinking about it you know you just yeah like, that's not, very yeah. scary to have to reset everything right yeah before well, live like, performance how presumptuous. Too. like yeah never never do that to like any like any male musician Mm -hmm. So, and like, like people from the audience too coming up and being like, do you need help? Like, so up your mic stand, I'm like, no, thank you, twist, mm -hmm. pull, screw, like what? I don't know. So, um, definitely I feel like one thing that I've been noticing too, as I get older is it's really hard to get over that, like that feeling of having to constantly prove yourself too, because you are, you know, you make, people make assumptions about you based on your gender and like what your limitations are. So, yeah, it's like, actually, I do know how to do the job that I've been hired to do. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask, as a non-binary person of color, what you feel like the experience is unique to that. Um, again, the, that's like a, get, a question that you would never ask a white person. You know, like, so, like, uh, Part of what I have to do too is like whenever I tell people I'm a musician, they're like, oh, I was just at the symphony the other day, you know, like they just don't assume that you're a rock musician or like a pop musician. Um, there's a lot of that that you have to overcome. And then another thing that, especially with just like the attention that's being paid towards race these days, again, tokenized for not being white. And then just looking at entering a room in any context, or especially in the DIY music scene, uh, the Brooklyn rock scene, um, everyone else is white, pretty much. You walk in and it's like, and you don't, it's something that I've been noticing more and more. Um, and like, there's just certain things that my white friends will never be able to understand. Um, and there was like a time when we were being courted by uh, a label, a, who I won't name, and I looked at all of the musicians on their roster, and they were all white, except with the exception of one musician who was half Japanese, 
Um, a lot of the successful female musicians I see who are like somewhat Asian are all half Asian, Mitski, Japanese breakfast, you know, like Karen O. So it's still not even someone who's like actually fully identifies as Asian, like who is like being given the attention that like, um, or like, being considered for these larger roles. And like, I do wonder how much of it is like, how am I not marketable enough because I'm not part white or, or white, um, or am I just not talented, <laughs> you know? Like, so there's a lot, of, a lot of doubt that comes into play based on your race, my race. And then on the flip side, do you feel like there are parts of your unique experience that you feel like come through and strengthen your music? Oh yeah, there's definitely like so much sadness that you only get when you're in a woman's body or um, that you get from just being othered all the time. And I think that it's a lot easier to connect with people from all walks because you understand what it's like to just fall into these subcategories that give you different experiences than what is considered to be like the standard. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and th this whole affirmative action thing, right? It's like, yes, I am tokenized, but yes, I feel like I have been given some opportunities that might, I might not have were I not like female or um, non-binary or, or Asian, so. So how did you get into broadcast? Um, I think I was trying to figure that out actually, but I'm pretty sure it's from like my LimeWire days, you know, <laughs> when I was just like, like the name looks cool, like this could be cool. Mm -hmm. So like, um, I actually only started listening to more broadcasts when you asked me to do this and I realized I'd never heard a full album. Um, oh, I just wow. know like a few songs here and there and I love yeah. all of them. So. That's a very different experience yeah. too. <laughs> immerse yourself in one of their albums. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, I, it's been really nice to like discover it, like something familiar, but also new to me. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Happy to hear that. Thank you. How do you broadcast and Trish Keenan inspire you? Well, in those LimeWire days, it'd be very infrequent that like accidentally it's like, oh, it's like a female singer, you know? It, it's, it's a, uh, it was very inspiring to hear not only music that like I couldn't even grasp how it was made like I feel like synth music was so uh, foreign to me as like you know someone with coming from a very acoustic like violin and um, uh, guitar background um, just to I love how weird that broadcast gets like the and when I say bleep bloop music that I make, like it's definitely like I consider broadcast to be bleep bloop, bloop music too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I definitely she encourages me to be weird and also um, scary and beautiful at the same time. Like I feel like that's kind of what their music to me is about. Maybe not scary, but like you know, haunting, haunting. uncomfortable. <laughs> Well, comfortable, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is often, yeah, tension in mm -hmm. music, for sure. Yeah. Between the more, like, grimy, textural stuff, mm -hmm. and then often her voice will be floating above, or some yeah. sort of beautiful sample. Yeah. Um, why did you choose the song Corporal to cover? Just, like, with the limitations of my setup, what I do with Grandma, I make live loops. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't delved into pre-programming yet. It, there's only so much you can do. It's, it's Core Party was one of those songs where it's just like the same, you know, it's over and over and over for the duration of the song, um, which I think is really fun to play within, to like have these parameters that you have to work around. So that's why I chose that one. It's always one that gets stuck in my head to me. Okay. Yeah. And what was your experience of working out how to play it and playing it, singing it? Well, I am one of those people who kind of believes that there's no point in covering a song unless you make it your own. So it was really difficult to try to take what is in my mind already a perfect song and like trying to come up with another approach to it. So it's definitely not true to the song the way it's recorded. The, the, my process in like 
kind of like exploring all the possible vocal harmonies you could come up with within this very tight structure of the song that already exists um, was was fun. It was um, I just like kind of locked myself in the studio and just was like do this now and the next thing I knew was at 5 a.m. so <laughs> oh at like a home studio um or? I have a practice space um not too far from my house oh um, cool. but it just has like a studio vibe so <laughs> cool do you have any fun projects coming up that you'd like to plug um I actually just finished recording um seven songs so a long EP or a very short album um with a buddy of mine upstate, um, like Bessie, but it was like a wonderful experience, like just stayed at their house for a few days and his wife took the promo pictures <laughs> for me and and um, that's going to be coming out on um, a small, mostly cassette tape label out of Richmond, um, run by a friend of mine, so um, called Choir Ear Records. So, cool, and, and is the, that under Grandma? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's cool. a Grandma thing. And then with like the full band, it's definitely been harder to do, given all the COVID yeah. things. Um, but we're doing we're recording a live stream, um, pre-recording a live performance that will be streamed not live, <laughs> like at a later date, you know, um, this Thursday. So, yeah, yes. yeah, <laughs> exciting stuff. I just wanted to say that it's super cool that you are working so hard on this and have like assembled a very cool team of people who are devoting their time to, including you to your dream yes <laughs> me too <laughs> and it's like it's awesome to be able to like work on something creative um, like in this time it's yeah really <laughs> i feel that so hard too yeah. and thank you also for participating of course. <laughs> for recording the cover and creating your video yeah. and doing this interview. Yeah, thank you for yeah. having me. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you. So that was an awesome rendition of Corporal. Thank you, Grandma. Uh, can you tell us some Thanks, more? Thanks, Grandma. <laughs> we love you, Grandma. Call your Grandma. Yeah. <laughs> can you tell us some more about the next artist, please? Sure. Joseph Salazar is another good friend of mine, another very talented musician, all around creative. Um, he's composed for movies and video games, and he's based in Austin, Texas. And this is his version of Long Was the Year.
Okay. So welcome, Joseph. Thank you for making time to do an interview. You are a multi-instrumentalist who I met playing music around Austin. Uh, I'm a big fan of your project, Technicolor Hearts. I know you also compose music for films and video games. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in music? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I've been a fan of music since I was really young and I, I took some piano classes and um, I, you know, I, I never really stuck with it, but I, I definitely was interested. And then I, uh, I studied music a little bit in college. And then at some point um, I discovered the, uh, you know, the Austin Chronicle um, with the, <laughs> where you could find other musicians looking to start uh, bands. And so I met some people through there and uh, that was pretty much it. I just, you know, have been playing music with different people since then. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much how I got, got into the whole uh, musical lifestyle. I don't know. <laughs> Good old newspaper classified ads. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And I know you're very creative in other ways too. Like you do graphic design, web design, photography um video sometimes i think too a little bit yeah um yeah i've done a lot of the uh a lot of the uh graphic design and some of the video for some of the technicolor heart stuff and some of it's definitely been uh, a collaboration i've done a lot of uh graphic design for for like events for for bands and posters stuff like that uh some cd artwork for some different bands you organized that Radiohead cover show that I yes. played in with my former band, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, that, was, that was really fun. It's so much fun to play covers because the audience knows the lyrics and sings a lot. That, that helps a lot for sure. So shifting to this cover show and our broadcast Trish Keenan tribute, how did you become a broadcast fan? Somebody showed me the album, uh, The Noise Made by People, which it's funny that, you, that that's the one that you have in your background there. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. There yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that artwork, too. But basically, yeah, somebody somebody showed me that album and I, you know, I really loved what I heard and then started seeking out other albums and just, uh, you know, really sort of appreciate um just pretty much all of their work, you know? Yeah, I was just speaking with Sarai and Jeff about um, how broadcast evolved so much from album to album and just the arc of their career from more experimental to more song-based and then back to sort of more experimental, noisy, short clips. Are they songs? I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I really love the way it's, uh, you know, Trish and, and the band, that, the way they just sort of create this world, you know, where it is definitely not just here's another song, but there's some, uh, it feels sort of like a journey or something like that, you know? I always think of their albums as fully formed worlds that you can just escape into. Yeah, I can see that. So you chose the song Long Was the Year to cover. Tell me about how you came to that decision and what you connect to in the song. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, it's it's one of my favorite broadcast songs, and I really do love some of the aspects of simplicity. And that, I think, was also a part, um, that was part of a, a factor where it was also practical since I just did this, um, 
you know, since I just did it on my own, it was a little bit easier to uh, make sense of how to how to perform it. Basically, just the uh, just the bass line and uh, some of the drum machine stuff were just on a loop, and then per performed all the synthesizers and uh, the vocoder on top of that. So, is the the simplicity of the song you said that inspired you? That's part of it. Yeah, I think that that was. Um, I think that uh, it both has uh, the musical so appeal the and also the 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 practicality. You know, it felt like it was something that I thought I could do a uh, that that I could do the way I wanted to do it. You know. How do Trish and broadcast inspire and inform? the music that you make like your original compositions or sure. or maybe just your art in general even beyond music yeah absolutely i think you know one of the one of the big uh things that i really appreciate about broadcast is um you know sort of going back to how you were saying the fully formed worlds it feels like there's such a um like it like to me it doesn't just feel like i'm listening to music there's so much of a like a conceptual vision you know, and of course, I know we talk, have exchanged some broadcast links, you know, and I feel like it's very evident when you hear the music. Um, and I guess also when you, you know, read interviews or, or read a little bit more about the band, you know, that there was definitely a certain, um, you know, it wasn't just about the songs, but I feel like there was a very heavy element of, uh, of a certain kind of mood or an experience. And I feel like that's definitely a big part of, how I think about music, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's that's probably one of the biggest aspects. I mean, I definitely love the, um, the choice of, uh, you know, instruments and sonic characteristics that they have in their music as well. You know, not necessarily everything's meant to be part of like, say like a melodic composition, but there's a lot of, textures and tones that sort of you know create create this mood you know that, that really appeals to me is there anything else you'd like to share about broadcast or if you have any upcoming projects you'd like to talk about i think one of the other things that i i did want to say about broadcast is that i also like the uh you know the the exploratory nature of their sound, you know, I, I think that like if you hear, if you were to hear different parts of different songs from different albums, you know, you really get a an interesting sense of uh, the different sounds that they were exploring, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it, you know? Yeah, you might even uh, wonder if you didn't know them that well, if you heard like one song from one album and one from another, like, is this even the same band? Absolutely. Yeah. And especially, you know, when you uh, like some of the uh, like how you were mentioning some of the really experimental stuff, you know, it doesn't sound, uh, you know, because some of their music to me is very catchy. It's very simple, a lot, lot of hooks. Um, and then, you know, some of the stuff kind of veers into into very strange territory. But that's kind of what I really like about uh, about their work as a whole. You know? Yeah, same. That dynamic is what hooked me and really made me think I've just never heard another artist like this. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're definitely um I feel like I'm I'm actually even recently I feel like I'm starting to hear more bands that sort of have I feel like have drawn on their sound or like have been influenced by them or however you'd want to say that but um you know the uh, yeah they they they're still pretty unique overall you know they definitely have like a very distinct sound and I, yeah I love it <laughs> yeah I agree their influence definitely has grown over time um I feel like the internet age really like they were on the cusp of it in their heyday, but I feel like yeah, I that like hodgepodge, everything but the kitchen sink sound is very much like of the digital age. And yeah, I just feel like they were very ahead of their time. And oh, yeah. there are a lot of artists influenced by them, but like you said, they still sound distinct and like themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much.
And um, Sarai is going to take my place now and, yeah, discuss. Well, Thank, thank you. I'm so grateful to be a part of this. You know, I know we talk about broadcast a lot, and I'm really excited about everything you're doing. Uh, so oh, yeah, thank you. Definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy to, to be able to do this. I just I wanted to like expand a little bit on uh, some of the questions that Kat asked and because uh, I so I know that you're doing um, that you did this cover on long was the year and I heard that you like the simplicity of the song and um, but I just wanted to expand on that and just ask like what kind of emotions like arise when you first heard that that song by broadcast and and kind of then was that the reason that you ended up choosing it, I guess, as well? There is definitely sort of a, uh, sort of like a haunting mystery to it that I like. And then also there's definitely, it feel you know, I mean, obviously I don't know exactly necessarily what the song is all about or what exactly what her thinking was, uh, Trish, you know, and what she wrote, but uh, yeah, there's just something about it that, that speaks to me, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think the beauty is that you kind of interpret what you kind of get out of it, right? Like, sure. so, so whatever your emotions, you said haunting mystery, I think that is a perfect way of um, kind of stating your emotions on that, like, it's mysterious, but it's haunting, like, so there's like this sense of, uh, it's, it's not just all that poppy happiness, like, <laughs> lucky, look, happy go lucky. Sure. Some of the lyrics to me are, are very interesting. And I mean, I, I guess that's part of the mystery is I don't know. I don't know if I know specifically what I'm what I'm interpreting from them, but uh, the, the lyrics are very interesting, too. And then, oh, the other thing I was going to mention was the, uh, the sort of um, uh, hypnotic quality, you know, with the repetitive uh, just it's very repetitive with this progression that it has. And I definitely like that a lot, too. Sort of, um, I would love to for you to explain to me your setup right there. So basically, this is a uh, Korg MS-20, and it's a uh, monophonic analog synthesizer, semi-modular. It basically, uh, you know, you don't even have to use this section. This just sort of gives additional options for um, for for functionality. And uh, I've got this um, moisturizer spring reverb. And uh, then last minute, I decided to set up a few pedals, too. I don't know. That could be fun. Got a reverb and a looping pedal here and a delay pedal. You know, I'd set up this MS-20 because this was an instrument that broadcast used. And, uh, and, I, and I know from just reading online that uh, they were really into spring reverbs. And uh, I guess I'll go ahead and just say this is kind of a really fun one because, as you can see here, the springs are exposed. So, you know, you can can, can uh, mess around with them like that, which is a lot of fun. I don't think I have, um, you'd asked about uh, favorite gear. I, I, would, I would say, you know, it, it kind of changes. This is definitely one of my favorite synthesizers that I own. And part of it I like because I just, um, I feel like it's, yeah, I don't know if this sounds silly to say, but I kind of feel like it's pretty simple to like just sort of jump in and kind of create some sounds that I want. Um, you know, a big part of why I love synthesizers is just how they very, um, they very much are great for exploring sounds. I know like the loop pedals, you know, obviously it goes, like you can make one sound and it just keeps going, right? And just repeats. Is that that's that's a so little pellet away? That this might be a little going into a little bit of unexplored territory. This is um, a uh, count to five. Uh, it's a pedal made by uh, Montreal Assembly, and uh, basically, I just got this one pretty recently, and uh, it does a lot. So I, I'm, this is definitely of what you see here, the one I'm least familiar with, but it also <laughs> is very easy to just sort of put something on in the background and then play over it, like just some, you know, some sound. But um, yeah, that's, uh, that, yeah, that one's a lot of fun. And then, uh, yeah, this is a reverb, kind of like that. And then this is a, this is a delay pedal just to, yeah, delay is always kind of fun. Kind of get, get some trails. Mm. 
you know, that that sort of uh, for this one right here, I have it set to a plate reverb. It just gives those it just gives those uh, that reverb. And then mm -hmm. uh, what I really like about this Dark World pedal mm -hmm. is that it, um, it it basically has two channels and one just gives some of the more traditional, you know, it's got a hall plate and a uh, spring. Mm -hmm. um, it has those algorithms on that side. And then on the other side, it kind of gets a little bit more into some uh, some weirder qualities. I don't. This this is a uh, modulated reverb. Ooh, okay. So yeah, so the computer's just playing that from here, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know I can adjust adjust some of the reverb settings. There's basically some different sections on here. You know, uh, uh, this section here basically sort of creates the tone of the synthesizer. And then, um, like, it, this sort of, like, generates the sound. And then you can sort of sculpt it with this. You know, I can um, sort of, like, take out certain frequencies, like here where I, uh, you know, bring in some of the brighter frequencies or, you know, if I want to make it darker. And uh, one of the fun things, this is just something that I, I personally I'm really like about the MS-20 is the uh, the resonance can get really intense. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, so, it likes that. So yeah, so we can get, so we can get uh, some pretty, I can keep it more on the uh, traditional melodic sounds or I can, uh, you know, <laughs> do plenty of that as much as you want, uh, especially with all the effects. So this is basically I'm routing the uh, the modulation generator to the mm -hmm. pitch, so that's you know giving it that like mm -hmm. quality where it's like bending, <laughs> and, and that can also be done with um, with the uh, with the filters as well. So like you know, so basically that's one of the nice things where if you want to just sort of have it do some things kind of basically like automated, you know. So basically mm -hmm. this is. Uh, this modulation generator is controlling this filter so it just gets brighter and darker just on its mm -hmm. own. So, so now I'm running the synth through this reverb. And it can get pretty washed out here. Like underwater uh, almost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that the max setting on this is just it's just a soup. Um, yeah, and then the as as I was mentioning earlier, you know. The soup, right? Ooh, okay. It's like crashing sounds almost. A real quick demo of this uh, loop pedal here. I didn't realize, I, I think, like, you know, when we were first, when we just first started this right now, right? I, I thought that, you know, all of them kind of did like the same thing, but you can really tell that they all just create like these, their own worlds. And <laughs> I don't know, that's super cool. I don't know. Yeah. So this is the reissue that they did a few years ago, but this synthesizer was originally released, um, you know, back in the late 70s. And so, you know, without some of the same uh, technical innovations or whatever, you know, so for example, whatever's on this synthesizer, I can't save. So if I find some sound and record something, you know, there's definitely some times where I'll, I'll have an idea and record something and then that just ends up being the final, the final sound because I can't just necessarily get it back all exactly the you know and it just sort of you know i wasn't even intention um uh, necessarily intending for that to be the final take or the final sound but then 
just that's how it ended up, you know, and uh, and you know, so I just sort of it's nice to be able to just have that recording uh, since it might not be easy to get back exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, so I think this is like the ending of our interview, okay. and I would, uh, but I was gonna, I just asked maybe like you could play us play us out. <laughs> sure, uh, give me just one second here. That's kind of, awesome. kind of what you just make weird sounds and synths. It's pretty awkward. Um, well, thank you so much for your time, Joseph. Uh, we really appreciate it. And yeah, thanks, was, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I hope you guys learned a lot about that gear demo with Joseph. Yeah, I know I did. <laughs> and you did too, right? Most definitely. Yeah. Really interested in synths, so. <laughs> Tell us about the last artist. Our last group is Lost Girls. Um, they covered paper cuts for us, but we didn't get to do an interview with them last time. So we interviewed Naomi Bissette of Lost Girls, and she told us all about being a musician, teaching music, and having a store called Sunflower and Friends, where she sells instruments. Let's take a look. <laughs>
care for Rosa. And I realized I haven't looked at my life insurance policy since Ava was born. I'm on hold with him now. Today yeah, he's the bulk of your plan. Look, I get that you're worried about your own mortality. Perhaps this fact will comfort you. As an NYPD officer, you're more likely to be crushed by scaffolding than to die in the job. Oh, God. This is a city of scaffolding. No, no, sorry, but I was only trying to point out that they are. How are you today? I'm well. How did you get started um, as an entrepreneur with your um, uh, with Sunflower Music? My partner and I decided to open a music store um, a couple years ago. We actually met in a music store uh, when we were in our super early 20s. Oh my God, really? I didn't yeah. know that. It's really cute. <laughs> it's pretty weird. Like we met in Guitar Center in South Austin. <laughs> And it, it was my I've been there. It did not strike me as particularly romantic, but it's super not. <laughs> they don't have good mood lighting. <laughs> but um but it was my first time there. I think I was 22. And you know, I I used to nickname Guitar Center Dude Center because it was just like all dudes. Yeah. Especially yeah. back in the day. Now they they like have to hire a few women, but yeah. Back in the and day. a lot of the marketing, um, I've seen yeah. Quaker devices highlight this, that like, it's all aimed at dudes. Yeah, it's just like, rock out, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or right. like a chick in a bikini, like holding a guitar or something. Right. Yeah, especially back in the day. Well, so I walked in there with my bandmate, who was another woman, and we were like in our early 20s, and we met this really super nice guy who was working there and it was Chaz and we ended up becoming really good friends and uh, we were friends for like almost a decade before we got married so um, we had a background together doing shows and playing music and things like that and we decided to open a music store um, we had been big collectors of vintage music gear for a long time and I had always taught violin lessons so we wanted to have a space where we could do what we're both good at um, and he works on instruments he's a luthier and uh, amp tech so we teach lessons we have a music shop we have a repair shop and we just do it all under one big um, umbrella called sunflower and friends and it's fun for me because i get to do all the art uh, my background is in art and graphic design and whatnot so i started just kind of going a little hog wild with this whole sunflower concept i think we're the only sunflower themed music store probably in the world <laughs> yeah I remember seeing that on your Instagram profile I think which is very cute and makes me smile all the time I feel pretty good making that claim to fame um and I think we're also I mean I don't really know this but we might be one of the only like at least part women owned music shops in I don't know, maybe Texas, or maybe if you're listening out there, sorry, other lady music <laughs> store owners, but I've never met a if lady you're listening music store out there, owner. Reach out to us. Yeah, we want to know who you are. <laughs> We're on a short <laughs> list. <laughs> I also wanted to ask you how you originally got into music, because I feel like I read in one of your posts recently that you're from a musical family. I originally started playing violin when I was 11 and my mom had an old violin and she had tried to learn as a kid um, but she had moved a lot so she didn't really get to continue with that and oh, wow. so you're kind of like living out her unpursued dream a little bit a little bit <laughs> It's not weird or anything, but you know, that was a thing. That's how it started. That was a thing where um, we just grew up knowing the violin was in the house and I wanted to play it really bad. So I joined the orchestra at my school. So that's how I learned. And I played in the orchestra through college at UT. And um, I became a violin teacher when I was about 16 and started teaching kids how to play. And when I was 18, I joined my first band. And 
Um, it was me and another girl. And yeah, after that, I was in an all female band and toured around uh, the country and in Europe and whatnot. And then after that, I was in my own band, Technicolor Hearts. So that's kind of been the, the lead up. Um, so yeah, just just general music background. I do have uh, both of my grandpas were our musicians. Uh, one was just like a really good saxophone player slash painter. And my other grandpa, who I didn't know or grow up with at all due to some family craziness, um, was a guitar player for Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. Oh, cool. Who did Wooly Bully. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> I didn't even know that until I was 14, though, because my mom didn't mention it since I was estranged from my father and his side of the family. So mm -hmm. Kind of weird, but also kind of an interesting tidbit of history. Yeah, for sure. Do you feel like along the way being like a musician and a booker and a teacher and an entrepreneur um, at any point you experienced any challenges that you feel like are unique to being female? I feel like for the most part I've gotten pretty lucky um, compared to some of the stories of my female peers out there. Um, when I was in Agent Ribbons People always say, you know, like, oh, wow, well, since y'all toured like six months out of the year, you must have like got a lot of like, you know, just like creepy dudes at venues and stuff like that. But yeah. I think actually being three women that were like kind of punk rock, like it was a garage band where I played violin and the lead <laughs> singer played guitar, but she's kind of scary with like bright orange hair, Natalie Ribbons who I was saying from telenovela. And then the drummer who's, you know, like got hairy armpits and tattoos and, um, you know, we're, we were just a little like, hey, uh, but in a delicate vintage dresses from the 50s and 60s sort of way. So it was like a weird, um, nobody messed with us. That's awesome. That was That's really actually cool. like one of my fantasies to be in an all female punk band. It was kind of intimidating, I guess, um, for like to us, we were just being ourselves. But I think that that was part of the reason why nobody messed with us. And then when I was in Technicolor Hearts, you know, I would get stupid comments like, oh, are you the roadie? And I'm like, here I am in my head to toe. <laughs> uh, Ensemble. <laughs> yeah, like, like sequin gown floor length sequin gown with like glitter all over my face and I'm all decked out and you know I'd get like oh are you the roadie and I'm like yeah <laughs> what about um broadcast how did you get into them and how did you choose the song paper cuts so I got into broadcast um through my Technicolor Hearts bandmate um, back then, Joseph, and he was super into them, and it must have been about 2011. It was right before she died, uh, which was a shame. I think they had, I think they had just played Fun 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 Fest in Austin, and I had. I watched that. some of the footage. Yeah. So yeah, you I, I just very cool. I no, I missed that. Oh. So, oh. and then it was like oh, here's this cool band that you never heard of. And then I got so into it and it was right when we were forming Technicolor Hearts. So it was an influence. And then she died, like, I want to say within a few months. So I felt like I just kind of missed the train, but same. Uh, she left us with like so much awesome, yeah. beautiful music. So it's, definitely still living on all these years later for sure is um paper cuts like a personal favorite or did mary pick that one 
I think we we all yeah it's it's one of the best ones on that record I think it's one of the best ones they have like to me it's like their hit um and I always loved watching that video I was I just know. gonna say I love the video too yeah Joseph and Flip your video oh thank you I think <laughs> Joseph showed me that video that that's how maybe how he got me into the band oh that was your introduction to them I think so okay. yeah. very cool was there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to I guess what's mostly on my radar right now is um sunflower and friends it's kind of like more than a shop it's like a lifestyle so <laughs> uh, that's awesome um, what we have going on here is the store it's a vintage music shop with like psychedelic sunflowers everywhere mm -hmm. um and it's like and you decorated it as well yeah it's super decked out it's like very as an artist it's been my kind of biggest concept piece like um from the way it looks to like we have all of these little like it's kind of like we have our own cartoon or something i don't know if you've ever seen adventure time but oh yeah like i love all these little time. characters and <laughs> oh, rainbows flowers and um it's yeah it's a, it's like its own little world so i'm i'm living that world i'm just really in it right now with developing all of these um comics and characters um but we're also starting a tape label so we're trying Oops. to get that off the ground right now and it's like a lockhart based label because there are so many talented people um both people who already lived here and grew up here there's a lot of young kids like in their teens and 20s that we're trying to like harness and mentor um and get get them put out on tape and there are a lot of austinites that have also relocated here so there's just a real um big hub of music going on yeah right now, i love so that you don't wait for stuff to come to you you're building your own scene and your own infrastructure for how you want the music to work and all yeah. the businesses and other work around that we have, there's a lot of talent um we're kind of sharing like we have artists paired up with art like sorry artists paired up with artists artists paired up with musicians so we have you know say this musician needs a music video like this artist is going to help them and then later oh, when this wow. artist needs help with their project this musician's going to help them so or you know if they need an album cover or whatever we're just starting this little collective of friends and it's all in a big giant victorian house so this is the the store we also live here so it's like just the meeting grounds for creatives to come and um, do their thing so so yeah we're doing that we have an outdoor stage so during covid times we're like trying to offer a safe space to still see music where people can social distance and um you know it's just the yard around the victorian house is pretty big so we built a stage out there and we were hosting very small intimate outdoor performances and just kind of seeing who materializes and comes up and deciding from there who's gonna be released first on the tape label so it's been really neat and fun that's so beautiful it sounds like you found your bliss in lockhart so no need to go anywhere else thank you so much for doing this i really appreciate it and it was so cool to hear about all the things you have going on and all the like just support that you're offering other artists. I love that because we all need each other, especially right now. Thank you, Naomi, for that awesome interview. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and remembering broadcast and Trish Keenan's legacy today. And thank you, Kat and Jeff, for having me on here. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. And we also wanted to give a few special shout outs to some people who've been helping us on social media. Thank you to Dr. Chris Smith for all the support on Instagram and for donating. Thank you to Marie, AKA Seriade, for sending me lots of photos and articles and other information. Thanks to Susan Warner for running the broadcast and related music Facebook group, which has been such an amazing resource. All the people on there are awesome. Everybody's following us on Instagram. 
and Nick Daly for putting together the broadcast archive. I've really been digging into that in my research. Yes. And thank you for joining us. Yes, thank, thank you, you for watching. Yes, and on this journey that we are on, we are moving forward. So keep watching. Yes, and thank you artists and our Wicked Lady as well. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Bye! <laughs>